Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for inviting us. It's clear that this topic is still on the edge, uh, but we'll go through it and we'll see what happens. So uh, this is work which is a collaboration between uh, the group in physics of Maurice Skolnick and uh, electrical engineering in Sheffield and the National Epitaxy Facility. The work's been done by uh, Aris Trapalis, a postdoc, and Charlotte Ovenden, my PhD student, who are both, well, Charlotte's already left for a spin-out company, and Aris is joining Lumentum soon, so that's why I'm here. So <coughs> this perhaps is less important given the people in the room, but there was a brief introduction to quantum dots in case we had some people spilling over, followed by uh, motivating the need for site control, and then looking at the growth experiments we've done and some initial characterization results and conclusions. <coughs> so we can skip a little bit through this, but molecular beam epitaxy, uh, there are people here at this conference who do this, even Bozovich for one example. So effectively what we have is a, a vacuum system where we have individual heated sources uh, which we evaporate onto the substrate and we use shutters to mechanically open and close to control the material that we're growing. And generally, unless we do something very strange with the substrate, growth proceeds by one of three modes. We either have a, a layer by layer type approach uh, we have just islanding, thinking of something like water on glass. Or then we have uh, an unusual mode in the middle where we get an initial layer followed by a relaxation uh, of the strain by forming islands known as the stransky krasinov growth. And this is the method that we're using to form quantum dots. So the important thing when we look at those films, if I just go back briefly, if I just keep growing, um, eventually these islands will coalesce and I'll form dislocations. I'll still produce a film. In the first case, I'll produce a nice film, and the other two, I grow quite a thick distance in order to um, get a smooth surface. But for intermediate thicknesses, the islands formed are actually coherent. So they're a single object, they contain no defects, and that means they have very good optical properties. And if we have a large number of quantum dots, then what we see is an uh, ensemble distribution. Remember, quantum dots, as we're told, in semiconductors, delta function like density of states. This doesn't look like a delta function. That's because they're all slightly different sizes. But what we also have is effectively standard kind of state filling, S, P, shells, and so on. So we have this kind of structure where we're adding more and more electrons and holes to the dots. If we can isolate single dots on the other hand, we end up seeing the sharp lines that we expected to see and a zoo of uh, different states which are effectively analogous to artificial atoms. So electron hole, two electrons, two holes, or charged states. And these lines are very narrow. And what this has done is in a standard semiconductor, we have uh, an object which is 10 to the 4 atoms or slightly larger, where we can have a single electron on hole and we can manipulate them. And we can create devices uh, where we just inject electrons on holes, making lasers or LEDs, or we optically excite them uh, to get luminescence. And we have our, a controllable atom, if you like, because the size, composition, strain, and the barrier materials are going to move our energies around which means we can attack different wavelength ranges for different problems. We can watch the quantum dots forming in situ. There's the one advantage, if you like, of MBE over other techniques. Uh, we can look at electron diffraction on the surface, starting off from a kind of streaky pattern. And as we progress, we start off growing this initial layer. And then eventually, when the island formation happens, you start to see an increase in the intensity at this point. And we can follow that through, and we end up with uh, chevrons, which are showing effectively the shape uh, of the quantum dot. And if we look in the two crystal directions, we can infer that the dots elongate. So we have this transition from streaks to spots that you'll kind of see mentioned a lot of the time. And also, if we have very good cameras, which have uh, advanced a lot in the last 30 years, we can start thinking about real-time formation by doing sort of pulse deposition growth, so very small amounts to try and control exactly what's going on. So that's just controlling the dot growth. Now we need to control the density. So the simplest thing that we can do uh, is just use the inherent non-uniformity that you might have in certain designs of, of crucible. So in this case, for a straight-walled crucible, region B doesn't see the entirety of the melt, so the deposition rate is lower here than at the edge, whereas a more conventional, more uniform crucible, region B and region A see in the same area. So we see a density gradient from the center to the edge of the wafer. That gives us a ring of the right density. We could stop rotation. And if we stop rotation, then we'll get a gradient across the wafer from the side where the source is to the opposite side. So we have a, a decrease in density going across, or in this case, we're showing this as emission wavelength. The emission wavelength is getting shorter. And so again, there'll be a certain region on the wafer which is good. 
or we can go to extremely low growth rates. So this is dropping the growth rate down by a factor of 100 or so, meaning dot, we grow these two monolayers in about 15 minutes. That gives us very low densities and, and very uniform. And we have this competing ripening versus nucleation. Why? So that's what quantum dots are. What are we trying to do? What we want to do is incorporate quantum dots into waveguide structures. And we want to do that so that we can move photons around on chip uh, effectively, eventually, to get towards on-chip quantum manipulation. Now, this is the kind of general structure. We have a sacrificial layer of material that we etch away to leave a suspended membrane with the dot layer. This is perhaps not the most exciting waveguide, but if you have a dot somewhere here and you shine a laser on it, then the light uh, transmits along the waveguide and we scatter it out through these couplets. We could go to a slightly more complicated device. Now we have a beam splitter. We have a quantum dot in one arm, and we fire a laser in on the other. Then we can start to interfere those two photons along this. We can start to make things like square root of swap, various manipulations like that, two photon interference. Uh, and we've demonstrated this with, say, with the quantum dot and the laser photon, where you get light coming out through the two ports. And two dots is also possible using this method. You have to hunt around and find those two dots and then build a structure around it. Um, but if you want to move towards clicking on the computer. I know they're clicking, I can hear it. There we go. If we want to move towards arrays of devices, then we can't have this random positioning of the dots. We have to start putting the dots in known positions so that we can fabricate structures next to each other. We can plan where the waveguides are going to go. In this case, what we'd actually have in the end, in the idealized picture, is tunable structures. So we have N and P-type doping, or um, put electric fields across the dot to tune the wavelength. And then you would also have tunable beam splitters in order to um, optimize the circuit. <clears throat> so if we want to make something much more complicated, we need to know where the dots are. So the approach that we're going to use is, seems quite simple. We're going to uh, grow part of our wafer and then take it out and etch the surface. So we etch the surface to create some kind of nano hole. It's not necessarily triangular. This is a cartoon. Um, create our array of pits put it back into the growth system, grow a bit more gallium arsenide to smooth the surface out, and then hopefully the indium arsenide will nucleate preferentially at this step because we've modified uh, the chemical energy at that point. And then we finish off the structure and encapsulate it. There's two approaches that we've used so far, electron beam lithography and local anodic oxidation. So electron beam lithography is very much like photolithography. Uh, you spin a film of resist on, the difference is that you pattern this resist serially. You go along drawing all over the surface, so it does take time uh, to create openings in the resist. And then you etch using either a wet uh, chemical approach or a dry etching approach to create those pits. So the tuning parameters that we need for that, we have the, the, the strength of the E-beam, the dose is going to affect the, the kind of exposure that we get. And also the drawn size is going to affect the depth eventually that we get. So larger pits probably going to etch further when we do that. The alternative approach, good to get a student started whilst they're waiting for the MB machine to arrive, and also good when the E-beam is down, um, is oxidation using an AFM tip. So in this case, um, in a sort of warm and humid environment, ideally controlled, but at least works well in summer, not so well in winter, um, you have a water bridge that forms between the tip when it's brought very close to the surface, and if you bias that, then you end up forming an oxide, and that oxide grows up and goes down into the semiconductor. So here we have an array of oxide mounds, and then we can wash those away with uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, to leave us with an array of nanoholes. Also a serial approach, much slower than E-beam, but potentially because we don't use resist, it might give us cleaner surfaces and better results. So the general approach then is going to be we have an E-beam pattern, which consists of arrays where we have a series of different doses we're also trying to optimize, a series of different sizes of nanohole that we're going to try and make, and also a series of different spacings of those nanoholes in order to look at the competition between uh, formation and migration across the surface. At the same time, what Charlotte did was also patent some other regions on the wafer using LAO so that we could do the growth at the same time. And then we're going to grow our structure by MBE. So the key challenges, things we need to look for, we want uh, good hole occupancy, i.e. we'd like to have dots in every hole. We'd ideally like them all to be the same wavelength or at least tunable. Uh, and most importantly, they need to have good optical properties. 
So I've already described a kind of this part of the diagram, how we're going to do the etching. Uh, this is the, just the layer structure itself. So we have the sacrificial algas layer now in that structure. And we do a lot of ex situ cleaning using chemical cleaning and then trying to strip off uh, the resists with an organics and so on. And then in situ, we do hydrogen cleaning to remove the native oxide before transferring uh, in the AFM that we have kind of a couple of places for dots. Now the dots may be poking slightly below and you can't see them because of the contrast, but you can then see that we're definitely getting dots in all the pits, but occasionally we're getting kind of larger objects. And then as we go uh, even further, you end up with quite big and probably dislocated dots. So we're looking at the effect of the kind of diameter on the quantum dot height. Are we actually controlling the dot growth in some way? And then also looking at, now this is single occupancy as a percentage, so anything that's empty or contains double dots doesn't count. And what we'd like this, obviously, is to be as high as possible. So what it tells us is that sort of the 50 to 65 nanometer kind of hole size, we can get a good number of sites containing only one dot. <coughs> How do we look at these then? Uh, so we have a number of different um, optical ways to look at the dots. Uh, so the first thing we've got to do is make sure that we can actually see them in our optical cryostat. So this is a, an optical image that's taken and we can identify at least the array and then we can work out where our laser spot is collecting. And a quick method of doing this would be to basically sample the entire array. So if we do luminescence on the entire array, we're going to get no indication of site occupancy and so on, but we will get an indication of the kind of homogeneity of the line widths and so on and we can move from site to site relatively quickly. The next thing we could do, which uh, is also quick, is imaging. It requires a very expensive camera uh, that has to go back to have its shutter replaced every once in a while. But you can then start to see uh, luminescence from the sites and you can start to see relative intensities. Um, you are towards the end of the range of the camera if you're going out to 975, so things may start to seem darker than they actually are because it's a silicon detector. So this is kind of what we'd see from the first technique. We're seeing some kind of ensemble. For the second technique, we kind of see whether we're getting good occupancy and so on. So we get information on the wavelength distribution from th this method and site selectivity here. <coughs> so if we now compare two of the structures, this is uh, an image from just a pure gallium arsenide sample with no buffer. And then this is from one of the waveguide structures. We can see that we're getting pretty good occupancy of the sites. In some of the arrays, we're achieving 100% occupancy in these 13 by 13 arrays. Um, so to better understand what's going on, we've now looked at the spectral distribution of these dots. But we'll just jump and say, well, what about the LAO, which was the first thing we tried? Um, so again, in AFM, we can see a dot sitting at the bottom. The LAO pits are, are quite sort of scooped and quite large because of, of the process. Uh, we only got to about 20% occupancy when we look in the PL map, but they are in in the positions that we can draw the lines that are guides to the eye. But a lot of the dots are emitting beyond 970, so we'll need to pull those back in order to use them with silicon detectors. If we look at the EBL now, and we're taking one particular set of growth parameters and just looking at the effect of the nanohole diameter. So we start off with very small nanoholes and we don't really see much. And then once we get to a size where we're actually starting to nucleate dots in the pits, we get emission at around 960. The holes get a little bit bigger, the dots seem to get a little bit bigger and the wavelength goes up, and then it comes back again when we go to the largest sizes. Now remember that what we said might happen is when the holes get too large, we can end up with multiple dots in the pits and might be, might be pulling the uh, distribution back. So another thing we can do, one of the extra knobs that we can tune other than the ones I've already described is just waiting. So we deposit the indium arsenide layer and then allow things to move around on the surface. Um, and see what happens, okay? So this is now results from a planar surface. We start off with our distribution. It's quite short wavelength. It's, it's quite hairy. Those are the individual dots. And if we then <coughs> wait for a longer and longer amount of time, going up to here, 300 seconds, we allow the dots to exchange material to possibly uh, exchange material with the substrate as well, but we end up shifting the distribution to longer wavelength. And the kind of optimal time that we're looking for to still have dots in the range that we want is kind of 15 to 30 seconds, as we think is kind of a good time. If we combine that technique with extremely careful control over the amount we deposit, then we can actually end up with ultra low dot density. So this, this is not an SEM image, this is photoluminescence imaging still, but this is a 50 by 50 micron image 
and we have six dots. So if we wanted to make a circuit, this is fine, but if you wanted to make lots of them, then you start to have a problem. So this is still why we want to control the position. So if we look at what happens on patterns, this was the panel we saw before where the size goes up and then appears to come back again. And if we concentrate first of all on uh, small holes, so on small hole sizes we see kind of what we expect with the effect of the interrupt, that they move to longer wavelengths, that the, we must be pulling more material in from the surface. And if we go to the sort of larger holes, we actually see a fairly stubborn peak that doesn't seem to want to move. And there, <coughs> possibly it's getting narrower, possibly what's happening there is this exchange of material between the dots and ending up with these two dots in the pit. So we can't go too large, um, even though we're kind of staying at the same wavelength, because two dots in your emitter is a problem. So if we look at those dots now in the third technique, which is to measure each dot individually, measuring its luminescence, we can actually then start to measure the line width and see, do we have sharp lines? Uh, do we have exciton by exciton and so on? Uh, and they do show good optical properties. So again, shoving things at the bottom of the slide, a distribution uh, of line widths that we've measured for E-beam for effectively a small number of arrays. So we have a modal line width that's around 40, but our, our best line width is approaching our resolution limit of our spectrometer, which is about 20 micro EV. So it's possible that if you look at enough arrays, you might find dots which are even uh, narrower line width than that. If we look at the LAO, LAO doesn't let you draw as many pits. The statistics are clearly worse. Uh, the best line width is not that far away, which is substantially better than most other reports of LAO in the literature where they've had to use two layers of dots. Um, but the mode is, is uh, sort of at 60. So this is promising. It shows that um, remembering that we have a, a growth interface, which is 30 nanometers away from the dot layer, that we're still getting very good um, optical properties from these, and we want to push them further, and there's various different ways that we could do that. So, I said it was short. In conclusion, um, for a variety of conditions, we can control the position of the quantum dots. Uh, we can uh, tune the wavelength. We've recently done experiments where we chop the tops off the dots to bring them back, um, but we haven't sort of got that all sorted out yet to, to present. Um, but we're in the right range for silicon detectors, for free space quantum optics, uh, from mountaintop to mountaintop, or short distance fiber. Um, we have dots, and we can do this by tuning the nanohole size and the growth interrupt. I've described two serial techniques for patterning. Okay, they're not necessarily scalable. Uh, over the long time. There are ways of doing E-beam where you don't turn the beam off. Uh, if you have the right size, you could just draw the whole wafer and just dwell and stop, which would speed up the process compared to blanking and trying to fill in the holes. Um, but the results indicate that they're suitable for use in devices. So the next step that we have uh, is to incorporate them into a, an active structure. So in this case, we, uh, the top and bottom of the waveguide, we put P and N type doping to make a diode so that we can inject that current I talked about at the beginning. And if we have a quantum dot over on this side, if we isolate the top by cutting into the p-type layer so that there's no conduction between the two, we then have an emitter which can launch into the fiber, uh, into, sorry, into the waveguide, uh, and then scatter out through the top. So again, a simple initial experiment followed by emission into more complicated structures. Uh, so with that, um, I'll conclude. If you want to visit the lab, you can do so by going on a virtual tour, uh, and this is the machine where everything has grown on. So thank you. In some, so for the people who are using this patterning to control the density for kind of laser devices, they've shown that they can narrow the distribution compared to the, the inhomogeneous width. So they can reduce it to like 13 MeV where they're getting 15 on the flat surface. In our case, we probably don't have enough sites to, to build up good statistics, but it looks broader at the moment. And then there's a question of whether you've got variations going across your E-beam pattern that you haven't compensated for, or whether, it's a long way back, I'll not scroll, um, your patterning parameters are such that your initial holes are uniform. That's one thing which is kind of, from a manufacturability standpoint, looking at the patterning, 
trying to determine the size distribution of the holes, including the depth. The depth with dry etching is not perfect across a whole wafer. Um, and then seeing whether that translates to controlling um, is, is kind of a next step. But yeah, right now it looks worse. They're quite broad distributions when we were looking in just ensembles. Uh, 30. Uh, that was what we ended up with as being reasonable, having just done some planar tests very early on. Mm -hmm. We should go back and repeat the planar testing. Um, but we could, of course, just put a dot right at the bottom of the pit, which then will be not optically active to allow us the strain couple to go further away. But you have a limit in the waveguide of the geometry of how far you can, how deep you could etch your pit. Then you could grow more by, by flattening off um, and uh, going too high in the waveguide. So there's kind of, I think, 20 nanometers up and down inside the waveguide is okay for positioning that dot. Um, so in that sense, we have a reasonable number of patterns on the wafer, but we haven't looked as extensively. And kind of the weirdest things we've seen, if you like, are differences even with just a single array about whether you do or don't have an array next to it. So you get quite high occupancy near some of the alignment marks, and if they're too close, you're sucking the dots away. So we saw some patterns where you might be missing one of them, and then everything looks different. So you really have to think about the stuff you're putting around the array it needs to be close enough to be able to align to make these structures, but if it's too close, it's actually sucking up too much of the Indian. Um, across, so it's a three inch, quarter of a three inch wafer, so it's pretty large. Um, we haven't started to look across all of the patterns to see whether um, there's kind of edge effects and so on going on. We're not at uh, a temperature that's so hot that, that we could be dissolving at the edges of the wafers. We kind of check that, but there still could be some variation in the migration length. People have, so that, I mean, that wasn't my, my read image, that's from um, Springfield, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can see that, you know the crystal directions it's going in, you can measure facet angles and so on in the read. Um, it does require to start to see the facet angles are reasonably high density. Um, when you're looking at the kind of trying to grow these very low, low density dots, it's more, I can just see the first spot appearing, if you like, um, don't move too far back. So, so actually to see the change in the facet angle and actually the other thing you can see is when the third line appears, that gives you an indication that you have a lot of dots. Um, but in terms of where we want to be for measuring, it's between here and here, which on any projector screen is, <laughs> there's no change. But, but that's compared to what it used to be, which is your head like a photographer looking at just the fluorescent screen yourself and staring and convincing yourself it's happened. So the other thing I've kind of had project students looking at is, uh, trying to look at kind of um, machine learning approaches to try and identify when this might be happening. So uh, principal component analysis and so on to try and work it out. Because even though MBE is not self-driving cars, there's still scope for autonomy of either recognizing the correct pattern for, for doing things. So this yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, excellent. Forward, pointer, and back. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me over the uh, superconducting guys next door. <laughs> um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to speak up a bit. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting uh, us to this uh, fabulous place. <coughs> Um, I'm going to talk, really a corollary, in fact, to Ian's uh, talk. Um, I'm going to talk about site control of quantum dots uh, by MOVP and by a particular growth technique, which is droplet epitaxy in MOVP. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, really, the development of the science into uh, technology. And this should work. I need to point that way, probably, do I? There we go. Uh, so first of all, a few acknowledgements of the people who have contributed to all the results in this uh, work. Uh, so uh, most of the work is done at the University of Sheffield, and uh, in Sheffield, semiconductor activities are split between the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering and Physics, um, and including the National Epitaxy Facility, which I will describe later. So we have a number of people associated with the Epitaxy Facility, and then uh, a large group in the Department of Physics, led by Morris Skolnick. I also want to thank our collaborators in Toshiba, including Joanna, uh, Mark Stevenson, and Andrew Shields. Uh, also, um, for work on uh, STM measurements, um, Paul and his colleagues at the Technical University of Eindhoven. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank our funders, uh, which is mainly the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, but also Innovate UK, which, is, um, which funds uh, industry-led projects at a higher DRL level. So before getting stuck into um, quantum dots, I'd like to describe a little bit about what actually is happening in quantum technology in the UK. Um, as you know, quantum technology is a very hot topic worldwide, a lot of investment, and a lot of growth in this area. Um, in the UK, the um, government established a one billion pound program in quantum technologies in 2014, <coughs> um, and there was a second phase to that which started in 2019. And like many countries, a strong technological focus in quantum computing, communications, sensing, uh, and metrology. Uh, and in particular, in these four areas, one of the, the big things that was established was a group of uh, hubs associated with each of these technology areas. Um, so quantum computing hub in Oxford, communications hub uh, in York, um, sensing in Glasgow, and metrology in Birmingham. So these are large hubs, they involve a lot of uh, research, academic research as well as industry research, and then also there's a large number of um, academic organizations who are part of the hub. So overall, these are the coordinating functions within the UK for certainly the development of quantum technologies. Um, as part of the program, there's also been a national quantum computer computing center that was set up um, in Oxford, and again, this is coordinating assets to uh, deliver on quantum computing. So it's a large program. Uh, they are now looking at the next phase of this. Uh, some qu impressive numbers with it. Actually, in particular, this number here is over 49 startups in the UK, and this is only in a, a, an eight-year period. 49 startups in this in this area. 470 PhD students being supported now directly under this quantum technology program. Um, so this is this is the background, and actually, a lot of the work that we do in Sheffield is funded uh, through this program. Um, we, of course, have a long-standing expertise in, in quantum technology in, in Sheffield, um, and we pulled all this together into a quantum Sheffield Quantum Center in 2019. Oh, and I did not want to do that. <laughs> I don't think I did press the button, but let me see. Press it again. There we go. <laughs> So uh, we pulled all our activities together into a quantum center founded in 2019, uh, and this is across departments of physics, Tripoli, and computer science. We have a long history, about 40 years uh, in this area, and particularly in the area of quantum photonics. Um, so we're bringing all these strengths, strengths together. We have around 70 academics uh, and researchers involved in this area, with currently about 40 million worth of uh, research funding for this. Um, this has uh, led to a number of uh, very good research results, also three spin-out companies in the last um, four years, which are now getting significant investment. And it's part of an overall strategy of semiconductors, quantum, and manufacturing, which is a significant strategic um, activity within the university. 
you can find out more at this uh, website as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, let me get us to do that, yes, is the National Epitaxy Facility. So Sheffield hosts the National Epitaxy Facility. It has done this for about 40 years again. Um, this is a consortium of three universities, Sheffield, Cambridge and UCL, and we're a national facility for providing epitaxial services to, to researchers around the UK. So we basically provide epitaxial wafers for anybody interested in semiconductor research in the UK. We supply onto, uh, to about 25 UK universities as well as some international collaborators. Uh, and basically people who don't have epitaxy uh, capability, they can come to us and we will grow their wafers uh, for them. We currently support about 140 million of uh, research projects and also work closely with industry. Um, and in the last, again, last 10 years or so, a lot of our work now is actually strongly focused on quantum science and technology. So we have significant resources in the facility, uh, five MOPP systems, six MDE systems, across a broad range of three, five materials and group four materials. So we have a capability of doing all kinds of different materials and all kinds of different devices, um, some of which are listed here. And again, all the work that I'm going to describe in the quantum dots is actually delivered through this National Epitaxy Facility. So let's talk about quantum dots. Well, Ian has already given a, a, a good background, but let me give my spin on it, so to speak. Um, so why are we interested in quantum dots? Um, well, it's, it's three important aspects of quantum dots. First of all, we're interested in semiconductor photonics, so we're interested in photons. And I um, semiconductor quantum dots really form a, an, an ideal system for making efficient single photons or even entangled photon sources and also have tunable emission properties so we can actually make interesting devices and we can control the emission wavelength of those devices. So the ability to create single photons comes from the exciton states within the quantum dot. So you have a variety of different types of exon states and if you take just a basic exciton then you can get a single photon source from, from the decay of this exciton. Um, but you also have a bi-exciton state here, so actually with a, what's called a bi-exciton cascade, whereby the bi-exciton decays into two excitons, you can actually get two entangled photons uh, with orthogonal polarization. So as long as you have a quantum dot that's very symmetric, these um, states are degenerate, and so they are fully entangled. And one thing that's important for quantum dots is if you don't have a very good symmetry in the dots, then actually these two exciton states can be split and now, you know that now the photons are not identical, uh, and a lot of our work has actually um, been on controlling the shape, size, and the symmetry of the dots in order to get this type of a degenerate system. The other thing is that we, the, there are well understood spin states in quantum dots, and you can do a lot of work with spin, and you can do a lot of work with the interaction between spin and the photons, including a number of things like spin uh, to path conversion, which means that you can start thinking about making circuits, which I'll, which I'll describe later. Um, probably the most important thing for us in terms of the quantum program that we have, the quantum technology program, is that we are building on the semiconductor industry. So the semiconductor industry is incredibly successful in mass, mass manufacturing for the last 50 years or so. And we believe that if um, you're going to actually develop quantum technology, you do need to have the ability to scale up, as in the title of my talk here. So there's a significant interest now in integrating many types of devices, including quantum dot single photon emitters, into full um, uh, semiconductor platforms. Uh, for example, here, this is an example of some um, ideas for uh, semiconductor integrated photonics using um, quantum dots and a whole ra range of linear and nonlinear optical techniques. Um, so there's a good review of this in this recent paper. Uh, this is an example of some of the work that we've been doing and moving in this direction. So for example, we have here um, a, a membrane containing quantum dots, 3.5 quantum dots, which we have lifted off of a 3.5 semiconductor, and now we've put it onto an SOI substrate, and we have SOI waveguides, and we have ring resonators, and we can do add drop type functionality. Uh, with this platform and uh, these are examples that we have of again making complex devices like photonic crystals and waveguides for um, entanglement of photons. So there's been a lot of work done at Sheffield to, as the building, the scientific building blocks for making the kind of quantum circuits that I've just uh, indicated there and there's a couple of examples of things that have come out of that work. 
All this work is basically be done on gallium arsenide based quantum dots. So in particular, you can get, if you include your quantum dot inside of the photonic crystal structure or cavity, you can get a high parcel en enhancement. Um, and this then means you can shorten the lifetime down to, about, in this case, about 23 picoseconds. So that gives us the opportunity to do essentially gigahertz uh, coherent quantum photonics, um, uh, including the possibility of making cluster space. Um, also, these quantum dots are tunable, and there's a variety of methods, including applying electric field to the dot, but also there's some interesting um, options in using electrostatics and uh, using um, proximity effects of different waveguides. So here's an example of two waveguides, and by applying an electrostatic force, we can move them relative to each other, and that gives us significant tuning of the optical emission of the dots. That allows us to do things like tune the dots in and out of uh, high Q cavities, uh, and this is then very useful for manipulating the single photons that we have. Um, the physics group have demonstrated basically single photon gating. So um, with this tuning process here, we can actually tune the dots um, to be in resonance with, uh, with photons. And in this work here, you can actually show that a one single photon can influence the transmission or reflectivity of an another photon mediated through the quantum dot itself. So this is actually the basis of a, of a kind of quantum gate using single photons. Uh, and uh, in more recent work, there's been uh, some uh, development of basically chiral properties of um, single photon emission in waveguides. So this is an example of where um, if you control the spin and you control the polarization of the, s of the photon, you can actually control which direction um, they move in. So this again is the basis for, the, for routing and selective routing of uh, single photons in, in circuits. So this is the background science, and, uh, and and you can spend your time taking down those references. Okay, so the T in this uh, conference stands for technology. So the question is, how do we translate this uh, quantum science into quantum technology? So two things. In the first, uh, Ian's already introduced this uh, topic. So we need to move from, normally when you grow quantum dots, they grow in r random places on the wafer. And we need to move from these random distribution to much more controlled positioning of quantum dots. This is the example of how to create essentially a Hongu Mandel type um, uh, arrangement on a, on, a, on a chip so you can interfere two photons, one coming in here, one coming in here, and they get entangled here. Um, in this example, we've used a quantum dot here, but we use a laser here. Um, if you want to do it with two quantum dots, then you need two identical quantum dots, and actually it's very difficult to find those two identical quantum dots here, as well as having other dots in between, which, is, which, is a, which can cause you some problems. So if you imagine uh, uh, making a microprocessor with transistors, and if all your transistors were ran randomly distributed, you'd have significant problems. And that's be really, you can think of this as the kind of optical equivalent of the quantum equivalent of the transistor. So we really need to move to much more ordered arrays so we can make more complex uh, circuits. We are able to do this, but only with one or two quantum dots. We want to be able to do it tens, hundreds, thousands of dots. Um, the usual way is seeding, as has been explained. So you basically create a nanoscale structure here, and you, and you want the quantum dots to actually form in these nanoscale structures and not in between, and that gives you this kind of um, regular ordering. Um, so the second aspect of quantum science is, as I said, much of the work that we have done um, is in um, gallium arsenide, so that's at 900 nanometers, and a lot of the science has been established at that wavelength. But in fact, for technology, we want to move to longer wavelengths, and particularly we want to use the C band, which is the basis for um, photonic uh, fiber communications. Um, and the second thing that we want is, sorry, so to, to move to the C band, we move from gallium arsenide to indium phosphide. But the second thing that we want is, although MBE is a fantastic technique, and we, and we loved MBE, um, probably over the last 30 years, actually MOVP has been established now as, as the industrial standard uh, for mass production of semiconductor materials. Um, so we actually want to develop these high quality quantum dots uh, using MOVP, and that's what we've been doing, that's what the rest of this talk is about. So 
the, uh, the quantum dots that we grow are grown in this uh, MOVP system. This is an Axtron uh, closed couple uh, shower head reactor. Um, this is actually a three by two system. And it is, we call it, we say it's compatible with industry. It's actually very similar to the industrial designs that are uh, much larger numbers of wafers. Um, but anything that we do here can actually be translated mostly into industry. Uh, so this is the uh, system that we're developing our quantum dots on to address that second te technological issue. Um, so Ian has described already the growth of quantum dots by stransky krastanov method, and that is a method whereby the dots are formed through um, strain relief. In, in, in this structure, you grow indium and you grow arsenic together at the same time, indium arsenide, and uh, when you get to a certain thickness, you get quantum dots formed. By MOVP, we're investigating a different process. This is the um, technique of droplet epitaxy, um, and in, in that case, it's simpler. So we, we have a substrate, we apply indium metal, and again, through surface tension and, and re reduction of energy, at some point, the indium forms droplets on the surface, and then we expose those droplets to arsenic, and the, the droplets are converted into indium arsenide um, quantum dots. So it's an alternative to stransky krasnov It is not strain-driven, so actually this is not a strain-driven process as it is in the, in the indium arsenide case, and that gives you various advantages. One of the advantages is that we have no wetting layer in the stransky krasnov method. When you have your quantum dots, you have a wetting layer associated with the original thin layer of indium arsenide that you grow, and that can be problematic in, in a variety of uh, devices, particularly int introducing competitive uh, recombination routes and noise into the structure. Um, so we have uh, established over, over a number of years the growth of uh, indium arsenide quantum dots at 1550 nanometers using um, droplet epitaxy in MOVPE, and here's an example of uh, uh, an optical spectra in the C-band, and you can see these sharp lines here are associated with individual quantum dots. Um, the line widths that we have typically in, the, in this uh, MOVP reactor, in other words, this industrial um, compatible MOVP reactor, are typically around 60 micro EV, but actually we do have a part of this distribution here that is below the resolution limit of our spectrometer, which is around 20 micro EV. So these dots actually have a good quality and have good coherence properties. One thing that we found in the um, MOVP growth is actually these dots, uh, they, they form, um, but they actually form within an etched pit uh, around the dot. And that's actually interesting, but also potentially important in terms of the site control, which I will come on to. Um, so a number of interesting properties of droplet epitaxy that make it useful for devices. Uh, we have, because of the, um, uh, the, the, the fact it doesn't rely on strain, we have reduced um, uh, in-plane, so you have high symmetry in the dots. Um, we have very good compositional homogeneity. These are actually almost pure indium arsenide uh, quantum dots, which can be challenging in the stransky krastanov method. And we have um, no shear, uh, reduced shear and biaxial strain associated with the lack of uh, strain-driven process and the wetting layer engineering I mentioned. Um, that means that we have flexibility in what substrates we want to use, the strain-free aspect, the fine structure splitting and the symmetry of the dots appear to be better um, than at 1550 than the stransky krastanov method. Um, and this has led to long coherence times, and uh, there is reduced noise. We believe there's reduced noise from the wetting there. Um, but also, when we move to indium phosphide, we can actually make even better nanophotonic structures um, using indium phosphide. So there are a number of advantages that translate into moving to 1550 and also to the droplet epitaxy. Um, so using random quantum dots, um, we've actually achieved a lot of very good results um, at 1550 with, these, with this droplet epitaxy process, um, and that's making, particularly making um, uh, entangled LEDs, so LEDs that emit entangled photons, and I'm not going to talk much about that because Joanna is going to talk about that tomorrow in her talk, um, but a number of very good results here, including all the way up to demonstration of teleportation with these um, devices. But we want to do site control, so um, how do we do the site control? Um, so we take this novel approach, which is that we want to use the, the, 
drop-it epitaxy approach and um, site control. So the f instead of trying to control to site control the quantum dots directly, what we uh, have looked at is positioning first of all the indium droplets and then the conversion of those indium droplets into dots um, it, through the droplet method, but in um, etched pits. So there's some advantages to this. Strain doesn't control the position of the droplets, um, so we can remove a constraint from the fabrication. So the fabrication, because the strain um, uh, affects the quantum dots um, in, in often very subtle ways, we, need, we would need to control the fabrication of the nanoholes that we use to seed the dots. Um, but if we remove that constraint, then actually things are easier. So that's, that's a significant advantage. Um, also, the droplet density and the size and the shape are kind of independently controlled um, is through the droplet epitaxy process, so we can actually match some of these properties, including especially the density, to the, pa to the pattern of the site control that we want. No wetting layer means that we don't actually have to worry about the changes to the wetting layer that may occur inside a nanohole drop, uh, in inside a seeding nanohole. And you can see here that we've observed, I showed the previous slide, we've observed etching in the dots forming in the pits. So these are some ni very nice images from Paul's group here that show that um, under different growth conditions, we have our quantum dots and you can get some local drilling underneath, um, but you can also get these dots appear in the in etched pits. And this is actually interesting because it allows, opens up the possibility for us to shape the dots. And going back to the idea of symmetry of dots and having um, very small fine structure splitting for entangled photons, the more we can shape dots, the better. And we think that the, the ability to match this etching and drilling to the nano hole itself is an opportunity for us to look at controlling the shape of the dots. Um, so just to, um, to indicate here that we've got some control over this, you can see that at different growth temperatures, actually the dot again appears inside a, a nano hole, usually um, a few nanometers deep, um, but note the scale here. So these actual pits are of the order of about 300 nanometers. Five minutes? Okay. These pits are of the order of about 300 nanometers. And so they're actually, the pit is about of the same kind of scale at that uh, size that we use for the seeding of the quantum dots in nanoholes. So the interaction of this natural etching process with our fabricated nanoholes is something that is of interest and that will, uh, could, could allow us to um, control the shape of the quantum dots. So the process of droplet epi epitaxy site control, we fabricate the, these nanoholes, fabricate them by uh, usually e-beam lithography. We do ICP etching uh, to make the nanoholes. They're about 30 to 40 nanometers deep and of the order of um, 100 to 300 nanometers wide. Um, then we do a wet chemical clean to make sure the surface is really um, good before we put it into the MOVP system. And also before that, we actually confirm that cleanliness using um, surface SIMS analysis, which we have in one of our MBE machines, um, as well as AFM. Um, then we grow a buffer layer uh, inside these nanoholes. That is, that is to make sure that any dots that we grow are away from the uh, etched surface, because the etched surfaces can cause noise. Um, then we deposit the indium, and we hope and expect that the indium will, f will fall into these dots, uh, into these holes, uh, and then we have site control of the indium droplet. Then we crystallize the, the, these droplets, and then finally we will cap it with indium phosphide to make uh, the quantum dots that we've formed into optically active quantum dots. So what kind of results do we get when we try this? So uh, the first thing is in terms of fabricating the structure. As I mentioned earlier, we actually do have, through the droplet epitaxy process, independent control of a number of parameters of the dots. In particular, for instance, using the indium time, we can control the density of the dots from around 10 to the 7 up to uh, 10 to the 9 or so. And this is important because we make uh, patterns uh, for the nanoholes, and if we can match the density of the pattern to the density of the dots, or so the other way around, the density of the dots to the density of the pattern, and we increase the chances of actually the site control of the droplets into the pattern that we achieve. Now, the, the, the precise details of the pattern depends on what we want to do, and in fact, for a pattern like this where there are four microns apart, the reason we want to do that is because we want to do optical excitation on a single uh, dot, and our, our excitation to fall is about that size. But if we were going to full circuits, we would obviously make much more dense structures, and then we match the density the, of the dots to that. Um, there has been a significant challenge in the growth of the buffer by MOVPE, and these are quite um, 
shallow and uh, narrow nano holes. And what happens in MOVP uh, compared to MB is that you get a lot of growth from the, from the side wall. So actually the control of this um, buffer layer has been very challenging. We, and we often, when we first grew, we got initially planarization. In other words, we removed the pattern. Um, so we've had to develop this to make sure that we get um, good buffer layer formation within those holes. Um, and finally, when we su supply the indium, then indeed we do see that the indium um, forms in the holes and that this happens at different um, pitches. Um, in the case of 1.5 micron pitch, we actually have good statistics. We've got about 70% occupancy. In other words, 70% of the holes have a, have, have a droplet in them and we get no interstitials. In other words, we get no droplets in between these holes. Okay? So that's not bad. That's fairly good actually. Um, when we go to the four micron pitch that we show here, where you've actually got a lot longer distance for the indium to diffuse into the holes, um, we actually get about 100%, we get 100% occupancy in this case, but we do get quite a lot of interstitials here. Um, so somewhere between these two is, is an optimum, and, um, and as long as that optimum allows us to do optical measurements, we're happy with that. A couple of interesting things that I'm not going to dwell on, but you can see actually that the droplets don't form at the center of the hole, so they actually deform at the edges of the hole. And we believe this is related to essentially the, um, the contact angle between the droplet around the hole. Um, but also there is something of a crystallographic direction to that as well. And we're not entirely sure why that is, um, but we have some ideas that it may be related to the etching and elongation. So I probably have about two, two minutes left, maybe. Um, so, uh, so good success. Droplets are uh, nicely site controlled in the holes. If we supply arsenic and convert them to quantum dots, what happens? Do they disappear or do they not disappear? And the answer is they don't disappear, but some interesting things happen. So uh, what happens when we apply the arsenic and convert to quantum dots is that actually we do get quantum dots and we do get the site control. So actually we have about 80% occupancy of dots. But interestingly, um, we form two dots in the holes. Um, and um, also, the, dro the, ho the, drop the dots form in the middle of the hole rather than on the edge. So actually the presence of arsenic causes significant redistribution of the indium. You get mass um, transport of this process and we've seen this in the random dots as well. And so actually we go from, the, from, uh, from uh, droplets around the edge to, to dots in the middle. We also get quite a lot of clumping. So this actually tells us that in between the holes, even though we can't see it very well in AFM, we do seem to have quite a lot of indium. And when you apply the arsenic, the indium moves around. So that allows us to get site control of dots, but it also causes quite a lot of clumping of indium. So we, ha we are still in the process of optimizing this. And I think we just need to reduce the amount of indium. That may also uh, control how many dots that we have in the, um, in the site control. So so this is good news because it means that the process works. We can site control the Indian drops and we can take the advantages that we've discussed about uh, lack of strain, et cetera, and we can play around with the interaction between the droplet and the hole and etching, uh, but we can maintain the site control when we convert into um, dots. These, this is only AFM images, um, so what we need to do is show that we get good quality dots so we have to cap these, and again, we've capped them in indium phosphide. And we do see evidence of dots. This is a kind of a, a macro PL um, measurement of our quantum dots around 1400 to 1600. At the moment, we don't see single quantum dots. They're quite dim, and that means that we need to optimize the capping process. Um, but at least we do see an optical signature of these dots. Uh, once we've optimized the capping process, then we'll start looking at single dots. We look at the lifetimes, look at co coherence, et cetera, of these dots. So in summary, um, we have established a droplet epitaxy of indium arsenide and indium phosphide quantum dots via MOVP. Um, we have indium droplets to indium arsenide quantum dots um, by arsenic crystallization. We've controlled the densities from about 10 to the 7 to 10 to 9, as well as other properties. Um, and the random dots show excellent properties, and we've demonstrated a number of things with these uh, random dots, both with single and entangled photo, uh, photons uh, in the C-band. Um, but we've been investigating site control, so site control of indium drop rights have been demonstrated with good occupancy statistics. Um, site control is maintained when the droplets are crystallized into indium arsenide quantum dots, uh, maintaining the good occupancy statistics. 
Um, and we have the first evidence of optical emission um, by of site control by this method. So our next steps are to improve the buffer layer of growth and establish high efficiency quantum dots and get, get that, those, those, that optical efficiency up. Um, but we also are looking at better control of the crystallization to produce single quantum dots in the, in the hole and also control the uniformity of those dots and explore the question of the interaction of the, the droplet etching with the hole itself, which may help us to control the symmetry of the dots. Um, and ultimately, then, we're looking for low line width dots, high coherence, uh, which will be partly a test of our fabrication quality. And once we have that, we can make the kind of structures I showed earlier with nanophotonic devices around identical dots that are site controlled, um, which is the basis for um, quantum photonic technologies uh, in the sea band. And with that, I say thank you very much. Use, you may apply. The question was maybe more a remark, but more than a point or more remark. I think you're completely right when you say that cool is not involved in transforming the linear droplets. But I think when you go into the crystallization phase, then the same for organic phase is what you call Yes, it. yeah. And, and do you see that as a problem for your dots, or do you think that's okay? Um, I think it's okay. I think what we've seen, um, what I showed there at the end, is that we've got significant amounts of mass transport, actually. So the, the, the thing about the strain is that um, in, the, in the SK process, the strain is very strongly controls the dot formation. So it, it, it controls the density, it controls the shape and the size, etc. I think by this technique, although you have strain comes back in when you do the crystallization, I think it's less direct um, because you've got things like the mass transport, for instance. And, and in particular, what we worry about in site control is that um, when you, when you fabricate the structure, so you fabricate a nano hole, um, because the SK is, very s is, is so sensitive to the strain that actually you've got significant constraint in your fabrication and particularly on the uniformity of that. So you only need small changes in the, in the, st in the structure of your nano hole um, to then cause you a big problem with, with the kind of dots that you have in the, in the different holes. So I think it's, it becomes more of a secondary problem than a primary problem in, in that. Yes. That's kind of also uh, able to do to see yourself gradient in the index. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. And, and you know, what I said at the end there, what we want is I put identical in, in, in inverted commas because actually we do want identical dots. Um, but it's very difficult to get perfectly identical dots. And that means, for instance, dots that are made at exactly the same wavelength. So we do have some control with with tuning, but we need them to be fairly close in wavelength. Um, and so actually, I think these techniques, um, like having pure indium arsenide droplets help us, because if we've got pure indium arsenide droplets, again, we remove the, the alloying aspect of the variation. Um, now we have much more, um, now we can just focus on the morphological problems. Yes, yeah, yeah, and you know, as you, as, as you can see here, um, that's, at the moment, we're kind of trying to get rid of it, but in fact, you know, we, there's some interesting possibilities here in terms of uh, these things, <laughs> yeah, and you know, these are quite nice quantum knots there, actually. Yes, we have, yeah, yeah. It's dry etch, so it's ICP etch, and then we do a wet chemical clean. Um, uh, no, no, I think that maintains it fairly well, actually, um, but it's just to, well, to clean up the surface, um, particularly for, for, for the MOB to put, 
put it in the reactor. So at the moment it's dry ash. We are exploring other things like uh, the LAO that, um, that Ian mentioned and possibly using nano imprints type technologies that we use with either ash process. Um, so at the moment it's dry ash, so actually quite steep walls with a, with a little bit of a, a, um, a pit at the end. Um, if we do wet etching, we get much more rounded holes. So I think we've got a number of options of exploring, again, the interaction of the uh, droplet etching with that. So I should say that this is really, um, uh, this is just kind of a snapshot of a, a, of a, a broader study that we've done, which is the, the size of the holes, the pitch of the holes, the depth of the holes, etc. And these are the kind of the best results of, uh, from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, part of the, w uh, what we really want to do is bring the whole size down to have it ma more matched to the droplet. But we partly worked on larger holes just because we do need to control the etching. You want, you want to make sure that you know what you've got in the etching and in the buffer layer growth before you start thinking about what's happening with the dot. So at the moment, so the next step is actually to move down to smaller holes and, and properly study the interaction. Yeah, thanks. Um, it is challenging, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's taken us a long time to get that kind of quality of etching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I the yes, sorry, I should, so, um, so we, we have, th this is just summarizing a lot of work that we've done. So I mentioned earlier that we use four microns here because we want to actually uh, optically address individual dots. So our excitation spot is about two, two to three microns or so. So that, that means we want these separated by quite a lot so we can just look at individual dots. But when it comes to making, you know, when it comes to investigating this, but also kind of making more advanced circuits, we would go to a smaller pitch. So actually, uh, you know, this is actually a 1.5 micron pitch here. Uh, we've gone down to even smaller pitches. And b but that all affects the site control, so it affects the occupancy because obviously it's related to the diffusion length. But interestingly, even with the large pitch of four microns, we get this high occupancy of the, um, of the holes with the droplet. Oh, uh, less than one micron, yeah. We've gone down to, yeah, I think we've gone down to of the order of uh, 500 nanometer, 200, 200, 300 nanometers, around 300 nanometers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, um, there isn't significant interaction between the holes in the E-beam process. So you do just need to be, as you, get, as you get very dense, you just need to be slightly careful of proximity effects in the E-beam, but the etching process itself is fine. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. This one. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. So it's my great pleasure to be here. So um, um, I, I would like to give you some taste of uh, uh, scientific approach to semiconductor, superconductor, quantum hardware. So this work is done in collaboration. So I'm affiliated with uh, Krakow University of Technology and uh, that's also my company, Quantum Hardware Systems. So I'm boking, uh, w working on, on such type of systems. Yeah. Uh, right. Maybe you can go to full screen mode uh, with that uh, screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me move on. Can I go to the next slide? No. F11, full screen mode. So how, how I can proceed? Yeah. yeah, it's good. Let me move to next slide. Okay. All right, so do I go? No, I go in the wrong direction. Right, I'm sorry. Right. So, uh, the co uh, today I will give the sh 
uh, some comparison of existing quantum technologies and I will specify a particular position, particular evaluation of semiconductor single electron devices. And then I will also uh, try to merge this, uh, uh, this approach with uh, superconducting uh, qubits. So in, in that context, the, the, the quantum neural networks and quantum graphs also will appear. And uh, at the very end uh, of my talk, I will give introduction, uh, I will give some uh, description of, of interface between Josephson junction and semiconductor chain of, of, of dots. All right, so, right. So basically uh, we have various uh, uh, possibilities in the, uh, in the framework of semiconductor quantum dots. We can uh, implement classical and quantum artificial life. We can implement uh, quantum computation schemes, uh, quantum communication, quantum metrology. We can construct uh, classical and quantum neural networks. And then we can uh, think about a hybrid uh, classical quantum algorithms. And, and right now my, my speciality is fundamental modeling of, of such structures. So basically uh, the current situation is that quite obviously uh, the, 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 the IBM quantum experience and, and, and Google approach to quantum computation uh, takes lead among uh, various existing quantum technologies. However, however, one thing should be said that the scheme of the size of Josephson junctions is, is rather in mesoscopic scale more than na in nanoscale. And it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to scale it down uh, due to the fact that we, we need to use a source of vector potential field, which we, knew we, we need to use coils essentially. So, uh, and this is spacey. On another hand, uh, semiconductors give us a, a very a good way of compactification. Most recent CMOS technologies use field effect transistor with 10 nanometers of channel length. So, uh, so this, uh, and also uh, the, the there's various approach to, uh, in cro to cryogenic applications. So this, uh, this, so th there is an idea that is still coming back, the idea, idea of position-based qubits that was initially implemented by Fujisawa and Feta in 2003 and 2004. So, uh, well, one feature should, uh, supposed to be uh, underlined is that semiconductors are quite noisy and, and superconductor is essentially macroscopic quantum state, so which, which has quite low number of noise. So one can think about possible merging of those two technologies, like, like a connecting of two quantum chips by uh, some sort of interface, and this will be uh, described later. Okay, so what's, what's the essential idea? So basically we have a field defect transistor, so we have source and drain, and we inject a single electron to source and it, it, it flows back and forth. So, so then the information, quantum information is encoded as a a superposition of uh, two uh, maximum localized wave functions, so-called Vanier functions, maximum localized functions on the left and maximum localized wave function on the right. So that's why this, this name uh, position-based qubit uh, comes from. So, um, so then uh, it's, it's by choosing proper polarizing voltages, we can generate various types of landscapes and in which given electron uh, wave packet lives. And in that way we can, uh, we, we can perform uh, various types of uh, quantum operations. So uh, then uh, the, I will not give description about superconducting qubits since everybody is quite aware, is quite well known. So I assume the knowledge uh, of, of, of the technology. But then, uh, then, then there's a question how to, uh, uh, I mean, create an interface. And the, 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 essential, uh, the essential problem is that semiconductor electronics is driven by electric field uh, as a controlling parameter and uh, superconducting electronics is using vector potential. And it's, it's, as it's well known, it's quite easy to kill superconductivity by applying some, uh, volt, uh, some voltage uh, uh, that is above uh, the size of superconducting gap. So the idea is that we are using Josephson junction like superconductor, uh, non-superconductor, superconductor. And uh, so we, 
we interface this Josephson junction with a uh, two or more coupled quantum dot system that is controlled by external voltage electrodes. So, uh, so in that way, the electron moves back and forth and it generates uh, electric field and uh, vector potential that makes phase imprint and uh, modifies Andrew bound state in Josephson junction. So, uh, of course, uh, one should be fully aware about the scale of those devices. So, like, if you consider two quantum dot system, in most recent, like, technologies, you can obtain even two nanometer of channel length. But let's say in transistors in, in such laptops as this one, this size of uh, channel length is in the range of 10 nanometers. And, uh, like, if you, if you have uh, the superconductivity, you are dealing basically with the size of superconducting coherence length that is, let's say, 300 nanometers. So you, you can put uh, many quantum dots aligned. Nevertheless, I'm just exploiting such simple model. So, uh, so you, could, you, could see, you could see this, this concept. So basically, uh, I also pre-assume that the superconductivity state is the lowest in uh, this non-superconducting region. So that's, that's why the external magnetic field and the electric field can penetrate this re region more effectively than in, in case of, of a kind of like bulk superconductors on the left and the right. So actually, I assume that this electric field can penetrate the, uh, so there are four nodes in my model. So it's, it's only present in, in node one and two. So we have a four possible channels of interaction. Yeah, so basically you can think about uh, this scheme uh, of so-called electrostatic interface between Josephson junction and, and semiconductor quantum dot system. So you have a semiconductor nanowire, and on the top uh, you, have, you have placed metallic gates. Of course, they are insulated by, by insulator. You have a single electron that's used here and here. And then this system can be interfaced. Well, th so this is so-called the electrostatic interface, and but you can think about uh, uh, you know s rot roton, roton cube semiconductor qubit position-based qubit. You have also various gates placed on the top, and then uh, you have a wave packet of singular or many electrons. So basically, you will deal with quantization of magnetic flux inside. So if you interface this system <coughs> with uh, flux based the Josephson junction, then by means of flux, this interaction will take place. So this is a little bit alternative approach. Yeah, so, so, so then of course, you can also consider uh, the systems to be placed in external uh, uh, resonant cavity that also can help uh, to entangle qubits and also does protect the quantum information. Nevertheless, I will not uh, speak too much on, on this topic today. Yeah, so you have also topological protection of quantum information. Yeah, and, and then of course you can, uh, due to uh, the current progress in, in nano engineering, we, you, you can construct various types of quantum uh, dot systems with various topologies, and then you can, uh, you can inspect how the system uh,
Josephson junction. So this is direction uh, in this direction of 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 like connection of of construction of interface for the, those two quantum chips with two different technologies, which I have mentioned at very uh, at the very beginning. So basically, one has uh, like six voltages that uh, control the state of quantum swap gate. It's due to Coulomb interaction with quantum swap gate. And plus, we have the uh, controlling signals that control the state of Josephson junction. So they do have such system. So yeah, so then uh, this is most minimalistic model that this, so this is, uh, so I described Josephson effect by four nodes. So this is naturally eight by eight matrix, which is Bogulov vision, uh, 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 which express Bogulov vision formalism in tight binding approximation. And then I have to interlink this uh, model with, uh, with quantum swap gate. So they have to, to take into account the, the tensor products of, of Hilbert spaces and then in, uh, electrostatic interaction which, uh, which takes place between those two systems. So we have the hoping terms for two single electron lines that, that, that uh, are represented by two qubits. Right, so then uh, of course uh, you can study the, the, the Hamiltonian and the, 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 the quantum entanglement. So uh, obviously the, the eigenenergies of the system uh, of two, two single electron lines are dependent on distance. So that's, that's kind of spectrum of, of eigenenergies. And also the, they do depend on superconducting order parameter. Well, uh, you, of course they are dependent on the spectrum is dependent on distance between two single electron lines. That's that's given by uh, by this uh, this plot. And so basically, we are dealing with six voltage parameters: plus magnetic field, plus microwave pulses controlling uh, the, the the state of of, of Josephson uh, junction. So so we have to uh, to to make our analysis in such type of uh, parameter space. So I. When you do very carefully, um, you can also try to spot the existence of topological phase transition in the system. So here, since you can modulate the superconducting order parameter strength, and also at the same time you can modify the, the voltages applied to electrostatic gates. So basically, you can also obtain the exchange of exchange of uh, uh, excited energy with ground energy. So that's a good signature of possible uh, topological state existence in the system. Yeah, so, uh, so then of course you can play with our parameters like, uh, like hoping term in uh, two single electron lines and to, to study the, the eigenenergy spectra. So also you, you see by electrostatic tuning only by changing TS parameter you can ex exchange ground and excited energy which is, uh, which is a good feature. Uh, well, you also can, uh, can uh, I, I mean, uh, by proper uh, application of uh, electrostatic, uh, by proper application of voltage applied to the single electron uh, qubits, you also get uh, tunability of its energies in, in the way as it is given by that picture. Yeah, so in conclusions, so there are some indications that system shows topological phase transition and, and thus probably have topological protected states, which makes it quite excellent candidate for very massive uh, implementation of, of topological qubits. Um, especially that technology of production of Josephson junctions is well mastered as well as uh, CMOS, uh, uh, CMOS uh, nanotechnologies. Uh, then there, you can explain this interface between semiconductor quantum chip and superconducting uh, and superconducting semiconductor and superconducting quantum chip. So you, you can go into possible generalization of quantum computer architecture. So for certain operations, the, the, the superconducting qubits could be better as they are less noisy. Nevertheless, I mean semiconductor qubits can operate very quickly. So that's that's you you can try to to use best of features of, of those two technologies and also make those two chips to, to be, uh, to, be to, to communicate uh, in a well way. And also um, you can use, change the paradigm of control of Josephson junction. So in the way that right now it's, it's controlled by vector potential. So you can 
you can try to use this uh, electrostatic qubit and then uh, control it also by means of electric field that is affecting the state of neighbor of position based qubit semiconductor position based qubit that affects Josephson junction so that way you can get a quite a big compactification of of the structures which is possibly a, a, a good feature because you want to, you want to have it as small as it is and there is a problem with scalability of waveguides that, that, that direct signals to superconducting qubits yes there is various type of work on on that field <coughs> I mean some of these models which I presented has analytical uh, solutions so that's quite good to have it yeah I also right now try to think about uh, extension of Kiskit so in that sense that can cover this interface which was just described yeah so uh, there are various uh, new directions emerging from presented concept and uh, yeah so that's that's uh, yeah and, and also I, I would like to advertise the coming conference and uh, that is from 9th to, to 15th uh, July 2023 about, about mathematical physics and, 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 uh, and technology uh, so this is hyper complex seminar so that the, this conference has ambition to, to, to interlink the community of physicists mathematician and engineer yeah so so it's it's, it's you're uh, welcome to to be present at this conference so I think that's it uh, thank you for your attention Technological control with the uh, uh, electrostatic control of the your you mentioned it, yeah. Just say some more words, yeah. Yeah, well, so so basically, there are two approaches. Uh, you create your uh, quantum dot system uh, using global foundries or well-established CMOS technology. So then you need to violate the, the the parameters of design parameters in order to create a, a, a single electron device. Uh, so that's one approach. Then, then the CMOS technology is very well mastered. So, uh, uh, but uh, still, you have to use the, the design tools that are uh, commercially available right now. Another way is, of course, to create your own quantum dots, and uh, that's, I guess, the various institutes across the world already have experience in, with single electron devices and implemented in, in, in quantum dot system. So that's, I would say, there are two main uh, branches of of, of, of implementation of, of, of semiconductor quantum dot system. And then, of so course, the one, two, three are the quantum dots. one, two, uh, yes, it's, uh, so those are four quantum dots. And, but of course, you have to place them on one chip. So, <laughs> with uh, uh, superconducting Josephson junctions. So, that's. Uh, How much is it that to do quantum dots? Do What's the size? Yeah. Well, um, I would say. I, I, I think I start thinking about 10 nanometers uh -huh. uh, so it's somehow I mean the, the most problematic is design of, of voltage uh, gates that uh, polarize this quantum dot system because you don't want them to affect you uh, I mean there's some noise coming from the, uh, from this uh, gates and that's a bit problematic in, in, in real operation that uh, so yeah I mean but since this system of quantum dots is well mastered like by Grinobel people and many others, I would say, well, this is doable. I think everything's supposed to be on one chip and also in the same cryogenic environment, so I pre-assume 50, 100 millikelvin. So it's quite challenging. So you need to get a quantumness of the structure of so semiconductor quantum dot system and quantumness of Josephson junction, and then you need to be able to spot this the formation of underbound state that is uh, due to, due to uh, this electron uh, movement. So of course you can amplify this, uh, this mechanism. You can put thousands of semiconductor quantum dots across Josephson junction line. Simply because uh, you also can have this argument that one moving electron or hole is not enough. But still, you should remember that this, since distance between quantum dots is so small and sometimes you can apply voltage difference even in fraction of volts then uh, the electric gradient is huge 
So actually, you can, uh, you can get uh, movement of relativistic electrons even in a such, such type of system. So definitely, you do have a means to, to generate uh, deformation of underbound state. I, but uh, this, this process needs to be better studied. I mean, uh, I mean definitely deeper approach than just Wishboard potential concept. Nevertheless, yeah, well, I would say it's also a good starting point. Uh, just a quick question. So, on the at a plenary talk on Monday, we heard about the importance of noise for quantum computing. So you can you can add more and more qubits if you like, but if you don't address the noise, then you're actually it's just diminishing returns. Yeah. So can you say a little bit about about noise in this system and how controllable it is? Well, so yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, there was there is a work of uh, so basically. There's very face protection against the noise. So for example, I, I there's already well-studied work of uh, implementation of position-based qubits by means of a couple of quantum dots, as I have mentioned. So you take two uh, quantum dot systems, uh, two position-based qubits, and you make them to interact with a, a quantum electromagnetic cavity. So actually what you do obtain is uh, there is cer in certain configuration, there is, um, you increase uh, the coherence time. That's the first thing. And then secondly, you, you, you obtain the, uh, so you can get entangled those qubits by means of, of this, uh, you know, uh, interaction with electromagnetic cavity since, since a photon field is, is, is entangled with a position-based qubit. That's, that's, that's also, so, so if, you, if you apply this, uh, the whole, kind of interface, place it to a resonant cavity, uh, pro most likely superconducting resonant cavity, then you simply, it's simply expected that this will bring increase of decoherence time, which is highly welcome. So, um, yeah, I would say, um, yeah, so this is one, of, one of way of thinking. Second way of thinking is that actually you are using only this uh, single electron devices to to set the positions of, of 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 electrons, and then instead of their position, you are using their spin. So uh, so that's also approach, and this approach is also mastered by Grenoble people. They have shown the CMOS uh, uh, imp uh, implementation of qubits uh, in CMOS uh, with using spin degrees of freedom. So, so you, you, you can try to exercise actual usage also both as well. I mean, spin and, and, posi and position. So that's, that's, that are possible schemes. And uh, of course, there's, there's some generalizations of this work by, uh, by, by error correction. So one, one should, uh, should look in the literature. But essentially, the system of coupled um, position-based qubits can be quite easily mapped to a spin because it's two by two matrix. And uh, so you can, you can quite make a, uh, quite a good analogy with a spin, uh, a spin qubit. And then having this analogy with spin qubit, you can use the design of, of error protection code. Uh, so also that is also implemented by hardware. So, so you, you, you can go in, in this direction. So, so I would say, I mean, uh, to be very honest, semiconductor industry does believe in the semiconductors. <laughs> <laughs> more than in Josephson junctions. And, uh, you know, th most recent uh, technologies bring this three nanometers of channel length in heat defect transistor, which is quite amazing, I would say. So th this really guarantees you high compactification and high compactification also means high speed of operation. So, yeah. Thank you.
this, there were some questions. So I'm quite happy that.
Hi, uh, thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to, to talk about my research today. My name is Song Jae Cho from the Department of Physics at KAIST. Uh, today I will talk about uh, my recent research on low voltage transistors and diodes, which is to extend the road beyond CMOS. And some of the results, uh, especially low voltage transistors, are published in Nature Nanotechnology and Nano Letters last year. And about the diodes. Hi, uh, thank you for However, as the gate length decreases uh, down to quantum limit, uh, Moore's law ended due to the high power uh, consumption. I uh, thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to, to talk about my research today. My name is Song Jae Cho I'm from the Department of Physics at KAIST. Uh, today I will talk about uh, my recent research on low voltage transistors and diodes, which is to extend the road beyond CMOS. And some of the results, uh, especially low voltage transistors, are published in Nature Nanotechnology and Nano Letters last year. And about diodes, it's not published yet. 
according to Moore's law, continuous downscaling of transistors enables today's information technology. However, as the gate length decreases uh, down to quantum limit, uh, Moore's law ended due to the high power uh, consumption in the standby leakage power uh, leakage uh, standby uh, state. As you can see, it says the gate length decreases, active power, both active power and standby power uh, density increases, but however, the standby leakage power density increase more steeply. How can we reduce this power consumption and extend uh, Moore's law? The power, active power consumption is proportional to the VDD, which is power uh, voltage, operating voltage, voltage scale, uh, square, and standby power density. Leakage power density is uh, uh, proportional to the uh, operating voltage. To decrease both the active and standby power density, we need to decrease uh, uh, VDD, uh, operating power, operating voltage. However, if you just, with the same, uh, for the same IV characteristics, if you just reduce the, the operating voltage, then what, what, what happens is the off-state current increases and standby power density increases. So to reduce both active and standby power density, we need to reduce this uh, soft threshold swing, so-called soft threshold swing, which is inverse slope of this IV, IV curve. So, this, if you uh, if you look at this blue curve, this inverse slope is much steeper than the red curve, and in that case, you can reduce the offset current and also the operating voltage. So, but in Case of MOSFET, the tradi uh, traditional conventional transistors we, we are using, you have been using in Moore's Law, uh, this sub threshold swing, inverse slope of the uh, IV characteristic curve, has limitations. It cannot be lowered below 60 millivolts per decade. So, alternate transistors are required to reduce this sub threshold swing below 60 millivolts per decade. Also, in uh, diode, diode also has for, for uh, some f fundamental limitation of thermal uh, uh, conventional diode. So uh, how steep uh, uh, this curve, this IV, IVG curve in transistor is is re represented by sub threshold swing, but in diode, how steep is this uh, uh, I the current versus both uh, bias voltage is represented by ideality factor. So if the ideality, ideality factor is smaller, then what it means is that you can use smaller voltage to induce the same amount of current. But in conventional uh, diode, ideality factor cannot be lower than one due to the Boltzmann distribution. So my research goal here is to overcome these both limitations of the conventional transistors and also conventional diode. So let me start with the low voltage transistors. So alternate transistors are required among them uh, tunneling FET is one of the most uh, promising alternate transistors. Tunneling FET has the carrier injection mechanism different from conventional MOSFETs. Conventional MOSFET operates by thermal injection. As you change the gate voltage, this barrier, potential barrier, uh, moves up and down, and thermal carriers over the, the barrier basically uh, uh, contribute to the trend. Uh, uh, trans current transport. So therefore, the current is proportional to this exponential uh, EV over K minus EV over KT. Therefore, 
this thermal uh, current, for this thermal current, subthreshold swing is linearly increasing with temperature, and uh, as subthreshold swing cannot be lowered below 60 millivolt per decade. In case of tunneling fat, the tunneling inject carrier injection mechanism is not a thermal injection, but it's band to band tunneling. Therefore, the band to band tunneling is basically uh, it, it, it's PN junction and reverse bias PN junction. So if the, this lambda, which is tunneling length, is small enough, and, and if we have some positive delta phi, which is the uh, energy difference between the conduction band edge and the balance band edge, then, then current can flow, electron can basically tunnel through this tunneling barrier, that's bended to bend tunneling. And this bended to bend tunneling is basically nothing to do, has nothing to do with this thermal tail. So basically it's cold carrier injection. Even at room temperature, it's cold electron uh, tunneling, tunnel through this tunnel barrier. So it's subterranean swing and tunneling, this probability is, has, has no dependence on temperature. And subthreshold swing also has no dependence on temperature, and it has no, no limitation at uh, 300 room temperature. So TFET could replace MOSFET and solve power consumption problem by reducing the subthreshold swing below 60 millivolt per decade. However, uh, there are challenges in TFETs to replace MOSFETs. Basically, the subthreshold swing should be lower than should be uh, less than 60 millivolt per decade over a wide range of uh, current. But in, in, in reality, what people have found that it's very difficult uh, to make fabricate this kind of uh, tunnel to tunneling fat, having subthreshold swing, small subthreshold swing over a large range of current. It's, it only it has 60 millivolt per decade, below 60 millivolt per decade, only in small range of current. And also, the, the biggest problem of this tunnel effect is that its own current is very low. The, the own current at the uh, subthreshold swing becomes 60 millivolts per decade, is called I60. I60 should be comparable to the most fed own current at the threshold voltage, which is about one to 10 microampere per micrometer. If the own current is small, that, that means uh, delay, tunneling delay is long. As large, uh, so basically transistor uh, switch on and off very slowly because it, you can think about, think about it as a, a capacitor, charge, charge the transistor on and off, but the current, if the current is low, then then tunnel, uh, charging time increases, right? So how can we uh, overcome this problem so to increase the, the I60 because uh, the on current people uh, found that uh, from the simulation that if you fabricate this uh, tunnel fed body with a heterojunction not just a single material for example here uh, the blue curve and the red curve the solid line uh, a uh, uh, dashed line basically mean dotted line means the the single material channel silicon, and this solid line means uh, it has um, a heterojunction body, a TFET body. One indium arsenide has small band gap, and another material silicon is a uh, large band gap. So if you make this heterojunction with the uh, uh, small material, small band gap material and a large band gap material. What happens is that this lambda, delta lambda, here tunnel length decreases signif significantly. And also delta phi for on the same voltage, on the same voltage delta phi increases here from this balance band, uh, band, band, band edge to the conduction band edge here, this, this height increases. The delta phi increase and lambda decrease, the tunneling probability increases, that means own current increases. 
So uh, according to the simulation, if you make this heterojunction body with the heter uh, uh, small Bengay material with, and the large Bengay material, a large on pron can be obtained uh, with the small SS. So according to this theoretical expectation, in 2015, uh, there was a report that the heterojunction TFET was uh, demonstrated with um, bilayer MOS2 and germanium. Germanium has band gap 0.66 EV and MOS2 has a band gap 1.6 EV. And uh, in this heterojunction TFET, they ob obtained, uh, demonstrated subterrestrial swing 60, below 60 millivolt per decade over four decades of current which is quite r wide range of current. However, I60, which is own current at uh, ISS equals uh, 60 millivolt per decade, is five orders of magnitude lower than the uh, what what is required value the required value of I60, which is one to ten microampere per micrometer. So that means this transistor operates very slowly. So what what why this happens? This happens because of the interface problem between the two material consisting of the heterojunction. At the interface, in this, in this uh, device, what happens is the oxide layer basically increases uh, the, the resistance so that the ohm current is very, very small. Uh, besides the oxide layer, defects in lattice mismatch can also, is known to cause this interface re resistance so that decreases uh, the, the own current. How can we uh, solve this interface problem? That's our uh, start motivation of the uh, uh, our research. So we use the black phosphorus material. Black phosphorus has puckered honeycomb structure. Along the armchair direction, it has very small electron mass, electron hole mass, light uh, carrier mass so that uh, mobility is very high. <clears throat> One pro special unique property of this material is that it, it's uh, according, uh, with the number of layers, it changes the band gap. Monolayer, it has direct band gap of 2.0 EV, while bulk, it has 0.3 EV direct band gap. So what we device is that uh, we we can make natural heterojunction by changing the thickness like this bulk to monolayer and then what happens is monolayer it has band gap 2.0 ev and bulk has band gap 0.3 ev on the same material without interface so that it has it doesn't have any oxide layer or defect or lattice mismatch it has natural heterojunction, and if you if we use this heterojunction, uh, then we can make a, uh, a TFET heterojunction TFET without interface problem. So we divide uh, we fabricate the device with this BP having different uh, uh, thickness, and we use this uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, graphite uh, graphite contact on the monolayer. BP to avo avoid uh, 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 Fermi level pinning and so on. Bulk BP had no gate dependence uh, because of the large thickness around uh, 100 nanometer. If we gate, only the monolayer band shift up and down. So basically, if we apply positive bias, uh, bias uh, depending on the sign of the bias voltage, it, the device uh, operates n-type or p-type. This is also novel points of the of our device because it, as a single device can operate n and p-type. So for the positive bias voltage, due to the capacitive coupling between the graphite and the monolayer BP, the band in region three under graphite, your monolayer BP band shifts downward. And then what happens is we need to apply positive gate voltage to make band to band tunneling occur. So it's, it turns on at positive voltage and negative voltage it's off. So it's basically N-type, N-type TFET. 
when we apply negative bias voltage in region three to the graphite, then due to, again, due to the uh, capacitive coupling, this band shifts upward, region three in region three. So to, re to make the band dependent tunneling between the uh, bulk band, bulk conduction band, a uh, bulk BP and the monolayer BP, we need to apply negative, by, negative gate bias. So on negative voltage is on, positive is off. So now it's P-type defect. So sign of uh, drain bias determines the N-type of P-type operation. So here's the result, uh, characteristic curve. What we have is both P-type and, and we demonstrated both P-type and N-type with a substantial swing over four decades of current, smaller than even, even 30 millivolts per decade. This is the record low value of substantial swing in TFET in history. And also, more importantly, we, we found that I60, which is own current, is very compatible, very close to the most well own current at the threshold voltage, which is about 1 to 10 microampere per micrometer. So order is very similar. This is the first demonstration of the uh, TFET, both N-type and P-type. There were no P-type, uh, previously there was no P-type TFET that shows a uh, subterrestrial swing below 60 millivolts per decade over four, four decades of current. And also uh, I60 close to the desired value. So temperature dependence, as you can see the, uh, in the band-to-band -band re band -band, uh, uh, band -band tunneling region, which is here, this is a P-type uh, TFET, band to tunneling region, the uh, substantial swing is temperature independent, independent. So this slope didn't change with temperature. However, in thermal re injection region here, uh, temperature as temperature increases, the substantial swing increases, linear dependent on temperature. For N-type operation of TFET, it also band in the band to tunneling region, the uh, this slope didn't change with temperature. However, in thermal conjection region, as the temperature increases, substantial swing linearly depends on temperature. And this device is encapsulated with HBN and very stable uh, over time. And uh, so it has endurance that, and also hysteresis free. And we use the, because of to, 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 uh, uh, we use the, the monolayer, uh, the, the very thin, ultra thin HBN. In the previous result, we used the uh, two or three layer of uh, HBN. Now we reduced the, the HBN here between the graphite and the monolayer BP to monolayer HBN. And what happens is the I60 increased uh, more than about two decades of uh, two orders of magnitude. So in the record high value of I60 was obtained by reduced the uh, Reducing the mon uh, HBN thickness. HBN thickness is very important to determine uh, to in 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 the device operation. So for monolayer, bilayer, trilayer, the capacitive coupling changes. So what capacitive coupling increases with less uh, reducing the number of layer of uh, HBN. So so small uh, thickness of this very small thickness. Uh, ultra thin HBN is required to increase the uh, the own current. What if we don't use the HBN between graphite and the monolayer BP? Then what happens is current just pass no longer pass through through the black phosphorus below HB uh, below the graphite because graphite has much much higher conductivity. Now all the current goes from channel just go through the graphite now directly. So in region three here, which is the black phosphorus underneath the graphite now no longer act as channel. So in that case, uh, device act totally differently. We couldn't. So this, this, so this, talk, this is too long. So we're going to cut this and go, go straight to the summary slide and then we'll get back on time again.
micron pair per micrometer. We also demonstrated recently the first drug source diode that operates based on cold charge injection from the drug source. And we demonstrate ideality factor for the first time less than one. Thank you very much for your attention.